I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion, Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In South Africa, 71 people are murdered every day. These are the stories of the criminals and the people who hunt them. My name is Paul Llewellyn. I'm a journalist and filmmaker curious about Africa's killers, criminals, and the cops who catch them. Joining me to discuss crime on the continent, as always, is Jared Lovaskachny, the former cop and current head of LNS Threat Management, who led the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 until 2016. In his time there, he worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases, and he is the profiler. Uh, please do subscribe to our YouTube page on YouTube uh, at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Profiler Africa. We're available on iTunes, SoundCloud and Spotify. Search Profiler um, and on others, uh, the podcast platforms. And uh, you can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Profiler Africa. And uh, do join our Facebook group. Uh, we are recording new episodes on a regular basis these days, uh, so we drop new episodes every Monday. Um, so do enjoy. If you have any questions for us, please, if specific questions, please do send them along and we will pose them to Gerard. Um, if you have any cases that are of particular interest, do let us know and we'll put those on our list. Um, we do have quite a long list and we're always happy to add to it. Today we're going to be talking about a case which is... An interesting one from the point of view that we've probably all experienced parts of this story. Um, it's uh, the extreme part that maybe we haven't all experienced. But Gerard, let's start off. This story starts with 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 a romance where where murder often begins. Yes, hello everybody. So, um, interesting fact though about this story is that. This was not one of the cases I worked on when I was in the police. There we go. It was a case I only got involved in at the request of the prosecutor, who I'd known from when I was in the police. I'd testified in numerous of her cases, Corn Cornelia Horamzen. Um, and she contacted me in, I think it was end of 2018, beginning 2019, to, uh, to get involved in this. But yes, this story starts back in August 2004. Uh, Jacques Duplessis, and his soon later to be wife Mariska uh, meet uh, through a mutual work contact. I think uh, Mariska was working at a pharmaceutical company in Midrand and in, in, in between Pretoria and Johannesburg, an international company. And she ends up befriending, if I recall correctly, Jacques' sister, who also worked there. And that eventually led to the, you know, the, her meeting Jacques one evening. But they start dating in August 2004, kind of on and off. Uh, then they later move in together. Jacques himself, his wife had, previous wife had passed away, I think, as a result of a car accident. Um, so this is kind of his, I think, his first relationship after that. Uh, is his, he became a widower. Yeah, widow, widower, yeah. Yep. Um, and they were living in Centurion, um, she then discovers she's pregnant in January 2007. It wasn't planned. They get married in 2009. And at the end of 2009, um, Jacques gets full-time work in Sasselberg. I think he was kind of in the occupation, health, and safety kind of sphere, you know, being an inspector, etc. So they moved to the Sasselberg area in 2010 to Henley on Clip specifically, where uh, Oprah Winfrey's school is, also in that same area. Um, and her... Uh, stepfather and mom live in that area. So she's got that social support uh, of them living there. Uh, and she's still working in Midrand. So she travels every day from Henley on Clip to uh, Midrand, which is quite a distance. And she had quite a good job at this pharmaceutical company. Um, he kind of, Jacques' work lasts for about a year before he kind of loses his job. And thereafter, thereafter he kind of does intermittent odd jobs, you know, installing pool decks and pools and, you know, CCTV cameras for the local school actually wasn't doing too badly, you know, with, an, in, with the amount of monthly money he was actually bringing in. Um, and that's kind of like what he's doing. So she's got the full-time job. He's doing odd jobs here and there. Um, and then what happens? On the night of 23 June 2017, her and uh, Jacques, the, her husband, and their son 
I think it was about 12 at that point in time, having a bride home. And pretty much just, I think just before 12, there's a phone call to the police saying, please come. Um, robbers broke in and shot my husband and he's dead. So the police respond to what they thought was an armed home invasion. Um, and they start to investigate it as such. The neighbors come out. Uh, they're quite good friends with their neighbors. They respond as well. Um, but things take a bit of a turn. The police realize there's CCTV cameras inside the house, and one of them has audio. There was one in the kitchen, kind of facing into the kitchen. One, uh, if I recall correctly, not where the shooting took place, but one at the entrance hall. I think those are the two that I've seen. And the police realize, hey, we should take those. And the brother of the deceased, Jacques' brother, says, well, I installed that system. Um, and I can help you download the footage because, of course, each system has its own unique format and this and that. So the police say, okay, great. Technically, they shouldn't have done that. It should have gone to the forensics guys who then coordinate and facilitate that because you don't know, you know, his brother the suspect, if all you know, and yeah. he's taking the cameras away and you're going to delete the footage. So in this case, it worked out okay. Um, and this was, I think, the Friday night. And the sort of by the Sunday police get a phone call set from a lawyer saying, um, I'd like to make an appointment to speak to you because my client, Jacques' wife, wants to tell us something. And a long story short, she then confesses to having shot Jacques with a shotgun, an illegal shotgun. It was a one that wasn't licensed to any of them. And she wants to kind of make a confession. So we then start to get I think she obviously realized, oh my goodness, once they go through the footage, they're going to see and hear what actually happened that night. What are your observations about, or tell us a little bit about what you understand of Mariska as a person? You've explained a bit about what she mm. did, et cetera, about their relationship, but what do we know about Mariska? Um, so, again, the things I'm saying here um, are stuff that was out in the courtroom. So when I talk about any mental health issues and her background, this is all conveyed in the open courtroom. Therefore, it's no, no longer confidential information. Um, she herself had had kind of a troubled upbringing. Um, she spent some of her time in Rustenburg, challenges school relationship-wise. Um, I'm not saying she caused trouble in the sense that she was getting into, up to, into uh, to problems. But um, I guess you could just say like a, a difficult upbringing you know, started dating another woman when who was out of school when she was still in school, moved in with that person, et cetera. Um, you know, at some point she had been, you know, diagnosed as having a borderline personality disorder, which is, is the best way to describe that if you, you're not in the world of psychology is imagine the most difficult teenage girl, you know, emotional, one day you're great, next day you're terrible, you know, raving, raging emotions, etc., uh, times by 100. And that's probably what a borderline personality disorder is like all the time. So it's a very difficult kind of person to be in a relationship with. Um, well, here it says that she, that she was diagnosed with bipolar mood disorder type 2 and borderline personality yeah. disorder. What, so, so the bipolar mood disorder type 2 part? So bipolar is often a term people throw around. Um, in a nutshell, it means you've probably had one or two depressive episodes in your life, but also maybe at least one of your manic episodes, which is kind of like the, the, the polar opposite of depression. You're full of energy, um, can't focus on anything, you can't sleep, etc. That's kind of what the what's bipolar, two poles. The one is the depressed side and one is the complete opposite side. Okay, and type the type two part. Just is that a is that a scale of how how far apart those two moods are, or what? Yeah. So basically, bipolar one is we're talking too technical. Is the more severe form. In other words, your depressions are very very severe, and the ups, if you have them, is are very high. Bipolar two is kind of like you do have your your lows and your highs. It's not necessarily fluctuating one the other one the other one the other. You know, like I said, you could have a whole bunch of depressive episodes over a period of a couple of years, and just one sort of manic episode that qualifies you as having bipolar. So it's not bouncing back and forth between the two necessarily. Mm. So bipolar 2 is kind of the milder form. In other words, depression isn't as severe and the highs aren't as high as would be the case with bipolar 1. Okay, but then with the borderline personality disorder, basically what we're saying, this person 
who's entering into a relationship with Jacques is somebody who's not the, like you say, not the easiest person to get along with yeah. and is not going to be the easiest person to be in a relationship with. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, if it's proper, you know, the full-blown disorder. So what, what psychologists would find if they're treating people who have this, this issue, um, let's say, for example, you said to someone, listen, um, I'm going away on holiday, meet the psychologist, uh, in December, so I'm not going to be available for a month. They will experience that as severe rejection. You are the worst psychologist. I hate you. So it's really difficult because you spend a lot of time with these individuals, specifically in a relationship, almost like begging and pleading. That's not what I meant. I do love you. Uh, you know, I'm just, it's just, I have to go away for work for a couple of days or I can't see you tomorrow night because of this issue. I have to finish a project. I, you know, so it's very taxing for the other person in this relationship because until you say, bugger you, I'm out of here, you're going to spend a lot of your time convincing this person of your love for them um but the minute you kind of want to do the normal things that everybody wants to do which is maybe like have a night off be at home where you've got a commitment they experience that as absolute rejection so it's really really draining to be in a relationship with someone who is experiencing bipolar um, um borderline personality disorder sure okay um so what happens next let's get back to the story Right. So essentially, when the police, as I said, they were busy in the, pros, in the, in the sort of stage of pro analyzing the CCTV footage, she obviously realizes, well, it's probably better for me to come forward and say, look, it actually is me, mm. before they realize it, um, in an attempt to try and, I guess, soften the blow or try and make it look like she at least, I don't know, has been helpful or honest. I don't know. So essentially, she goes to a lawyer. The lawyer contacts the police. So what she says happened, and this is to some degree confirmed with what we can sort of pick up on the CCTV footage and the camera um, information, was that on the particular night in question, um, 23rd of June, they were having a braai, and at some point, the father, Jacques, wants to discipline the son. Uh, if I recall correctly, it was to do with him having put some, I think, headphones for like a cell phone in, in a glass of water, which of course damaged them. Now, according to, to Mariska, and we only have her version of, of if this was really what the, the cause of it was, the, the father then wanted to discipline the son using a belt. In other words, you know, smack him on the backside with a belt. And that caused her to intervene and have an argument, and that sparked off the argument. Look, they've had lots of arguments in the past. I mean, like I said, she's very volatile because of a borderline personality disorder. There's alcohol involved. Both of them would enjoy drinking, you know, on a weekend with friends, she unfortunately seemed to be the type that when she drinks, she gets louder and more verbally challenging and aggressive, and the mouth does not hold itself back. He, from the clip, clips and footage that we've seen of events when they were together, seemed to be more reserved and would, if he would, you know, she would also have a go at him when she's had a few drinks. You know, you're useless, you don't earn enough money, um, F, 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 this, F, that. So, um, very difficult person when you throw alcohol into the mix. But again, alcohol was not a good idea for either of these two people. Um, I don't want to make it sound like the deceased is always 100% a saint. You know, the victims aren't always saints. Um, so what she then does is the argument breaks out because he's trying to discipline the son in, the, in his bedroom. She then takes the son and says, you know, go into here, come into our room, stay here. Um, then there has, the argument continues between the two of them. We see this on the CCTV footage. We see them having a fight in the in the kitchen where she's all in his face, waving, sticking a finger in his face, literally, you know, poking f away. Um, he pushes her; she falls to the ground. He never hits her, as far as we can see, and I don't think, recall correctly that she says that he physically. I, th I think she did later say that he he tried to have his hands around her neck. I don't think we see that on the footage. No. Long story short, after, sure, uh, I don't know, I guess 30 minutes, 40 minutes of them arguing, carrying on, it kind of simmers, it flares up again, etc. He then is, is standing in the lounge at his computer with headphones on because he liked to, I guess, mix music, etc. And then in that particular time, she said to the son, don't come out the main bedroom until I come and get you. And she lifts up the mattress and underneath is a single barrel shotgun sawn off. In other words, it's got like a pistol grip. It's not got a full on stock, which they got from somewhere. We don't know where this, you know, where this came from. And she then walks down the passage from her bedroom past her son's, you know, bedroom door, etc. Down at the bottom of the passage is where Jacques, the victim, is standing now with his back to, to her listening to music. And from about 30 to 60 centimeters away, she pulls the trigger. 
and he drops instantly and is dead. Um, and do, do we'll put some of the stuff, some of the media stuff up on uh, social media pages. So go check it out um, on Instagram or Facebook. Um, we'll put up some of the pictures from the CCTV and a bit of the audio where you actually hear the gunshot. Um, so do go and check that out. But uh, what I'm seeing here is something which may be up to the shooting part. Um, something which maybe a lot of people are quite familiar with, you know, um, uh, intimate couple, a part, you know, uh, a couple at home. Um, alcohol is involved, um, an argument starts and it escalates mm. and it escalates and it escalates. Yeah. And this is one of those examples of where the escalation can get right to kind of the ultimate act of violence, which mm. is she then goes and retrieves a gun and shoots him for whatever reason. What is her, so, so what is she saying? Why is, what is her argument when she's reached out to the police um, on mm. the Monday? She obviously is aware um, from her own, you know, forensically, yeah. that there's going to be enough evidence on the scene to implicate her. So she's trying to get out in front of this thing. Yeah. Um, what is her story as to why she pulled the trigger? So, because she's not she's not denying doing it at yeah, all from yeah. day, from from the get go. Yeah. yeah. But, but there's obviously a motivation that she's going to bring into the mix here that she's had the opportunity to speak to a lawyer about. Yeah. So so. Before the actual shooting, I would say maybe 20 minutes, half an hour before, she phoned the cops to say, you know, my husband's assaulting me. So she did call them to report domestic violence. I mean, they were domestic violence in each other yes. <laughs> in that scenario. Yeah. And the cops hadn't yet responded. Then the second phone call, which was, you know, as I said, maybe 15, 20 minutes later, after she, just after she shot him. And then she's full, given the false story about the, the, the break-in. Um, so ultimately, she goes to... You know, this, this thing gets ready for trial and her lawyers decide that they're going to see if they can make this a test case for the concept of battered woman syndrome as a defense for what happened. Um, what is a test case? So in other words, if this, is, if this is successful in the high court, then, you know, other people might be able to then use this in other similar cases as, you know, they can argue that in state versus duplicy, Battle woman syndrome was raised, similar circumstances to try and obviously convince the court to, you know, maybe find a not guilty finding in that particular case that, that, that they're now dealing with. So now it's kind of built on faulty premises for a few reasons. But one of the reasons why I think they chose that is that Mariska had been seen a psychologist for quite a few years prior to the shooting. Um, and that psychologist had made this diagnosis well, at some point about the bipolar and the the yeah so so she'd seen, seen a psychiatrist disorder. who had made that diagnosis and then she'd also at around about the same time and continued with seeing the psychologist okay. and he also i think in his notes and this is part of the problem his notes were shocking refers to personality disorder which a borderline personality disorder is mm -hmm. and bipolar um but it, she had been seen a psychologist since February 2013. I remember the shooting is in 2017, if I recall correctly, so four years later. So on and off, but kind of more for her own therapy, you know, supported therapy. She would sometimes take their child with for his own sessions. The deceased husband never participated in these sessions. So he was never officially assessed by the psychologist. Um, and in fact, she'd actually seen the psychologist the day before the shooting. So I think the lawyers had interviewed the psychologist. The psychologist says he thinks that battered woman syndrome was what was taking place here, and that's the reason why she pulled the trigger on the night in question. Um, and I think the lawyers just said, great, we're going to use this. We're going to call you as an expert witness um, to testify about this issue, and we're going to argue our client is not responsible because of this. Now, it's actually not a proper legal defense, which we'll maybe get into that in, in, in a while later. So when I eventually get involved in this case, the trial has already started. I wasn't involved from the investigation point of view. And remember, I was already out of the police at that point in time. And the prosecutor phoned me just saying, Gerard, listen, it's me, and I've got this case, and there's, this, there's a psychologist testifying, um, and he's claiming one, two, three, and four. And I said, well, I'm happy to you know, assist you. Just send me the report. And what she was telling me, it was, sounded like, whoa, hang on a minute. This guy shouldn't be testifying about these things because he had been her treating practitioner. You cannot have someone who is the treating practitioner 
coming in court and giving a forensic opinion. It's conflict of interest. You, you can't play the role of the expert witness wherein you were also the treating practitioner. It's two conflicting roles. It's in the ethical guidelines. Many psychologists have been found guilty of this at the HPCSA. And I said, well, that on its own is actually a huge problem. So it has to be an indes- you need an yeah. independent assessment of somebody yeah. that has not previously treated her. Yeah, and, that, and their only job is the first time they hear about this case is when a lawyer phones them and says, we want you to come and give us a forensic opinion. Um, and, and it's conflict of interest because as a treating practitioner, you're there to act in the best interest of your patient. As a forensic expert, I'm not here to act in your best interest. I'm here to act in the best interests of society. Yeah, I'm here to, to help tr- the judge or the magistrate. You, you know, I'm actually the magistrate's witness. Although you, yeah. you or you might be calling me as an expert, my duty is to serve the court. Mm. So my opinion should be the same whether I'm called by the prosecution or I'm being called by the defense if I'm looking at the same set as facts. If you're altering it to the benefit of the one or the other, you're not being objective. You're not being an expert witness. Isn't this like standard lawyer knowledge? So, so I mean, wh- well, where's, the, where's the kind of fundamental knowledge here? <sighs> You see, this, this comes back to a few things. Firstly, lawyers don't know what psychologists are supposed to do and not supposed to do. So we cannot expect the lawyer to say to the psychologist, you can't say that. Um, we don't train psychologists properly. We don't, none of these issues about conflict of interest, very rarely, I mean, in my training, was never touched on. And a lot of the psychologists that I work with say they didn't know that. So we're not teaching psychologists or st- student psychologists the one oh ones of do's and don'ts when it comes to what happens if a lawyer phones you. Okay. You have you have them coming you know, you have psychologists who have this deluded belief that if they get a subpoena, they're not gonna go to court because they're not they're not prepared to say anything about their client. Well, you're not allowed to ignore a subpoena. That's an order from the court. Mm. If you don't pitch up, you're gonna get arrested and brought to court. The court wouldn't send you the subpoena unless it was legal and ethical. Yeah. And the ethical guidelines actually say that you are supposed to follow any instruction from the court. So, but we're not teaching psychologists. So you get them doing dumb things through ignorance. But ultimately, unfortunately, the, it's gonna, they're gonna look at it and say, you're a psychologist, you're supposed to know better. If you're not sure, you're supposed to get some guidance and supervision. You're supposed to phone your professional insurers and say, I've got this request. Is it okay? Should I go ahead and do it? Am I allowed to do it? What am I? What can you advise me? That's what professional insurance, which all psychologists are supposed to have, is also there to guide you upon. But if anything, you phone a colleague who does, does a bit of this, have, have a bit of this knowledge and say, I just got a subpoena or I was asked this. What are my limitations? Can I and then, then get advice from a colleague? Um, so you can't fall back and say, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do this. Unfortunately, that's going to help you as the psychologist who's transgressed. Just from the lawyer's perspective as well, um, you're trying to say, you say, talk about this being, they, they, you know, they wanted to try this as a test case for battered woman syndrome. Now, in South Africa, with, the, with such high cases of domestic violence, there's a lot of battered women. Mm. So also for the lawyers not to kind of, I mean, it's a big ask. It's a big test case. This mm. would be a big test case because... I mean, it's almost like, wouldn't the floodgates, my question is, wouldn't the floodgates yeah. be kind of open on well, women yeah. being battered, which there are a lot of, yeah. now killing their husbands? Is it almost a passport? Yeah. So, yes, you always have to be careful how, because any test case can become, if it's in the high court, a benchmark for how other courts are supposed to view the same scenario. Now, each case is different on its own merits. I mean, if you have a woman who poisons her husband or while he's asleep, goes and beats him with a baseball bat to death, you know, the courts are going to say to you, yeah, maybe even if you, if, even if you did have better women, so why didn't you leave? He's asleep. You aren't under direct threat right now. You know, versus someone who's in a case of their husband's busy strangling them, well, that's just self-defense. <laughs> you don't even have to raise anything else except self-defense. So, yes, but the minute one court, high court, accepts something, it does create the potential that other people will try and use that in their own scenarios as a justification. Mm. I mean, we're going to get into the issue of battered woman syndrome in a moment, but it's not quite actually a defense. So even the lawyers didn't quite understand what they're dealing with. Yeah. Um, 
And very often you have to ask yourself the question, is this a complete, because when we talk about a defense, we mean that is something that's going to allow you to walk out that courtroom not guilty. Yeah. That's huge. Versus there are a lot of circumstances that are mitigating, but then we introduce those at sentencing to say to the court, my client did this, but please court, let's sentence her more leniently because of one, two, three, four, five. And people often try and escalate something that's probably mitigating to be actually an excuse, in other words, a defense. And you kind of also, sometimes lawyers perhaps don't do that very well. Well, I think that was my question, is that like, this is a pretty like ballsy move as a lawyer. Some would call it maybe a little bit naive and silly to think that you can elevate this aspect of their relationship mm. to the point in the legal system where it's now an argument to get this person yeah. off. Um, you know, that's a... It's a big ask, and I, you'd think as a lawyer you'd be able to make that calculation in your mind and go, you know, this is not, mm. a, this is not a, a, a sensible route to pursue because it's such a big mountain to climb. Yeah. So, and again, you know, not all lawyers are that great or know their stuff or understand this stuff yeah. and take a chance. And my, my, I didn't find this lawyer to be particularly good. Um, or perhaps just more, okay. arrogant, more arrogant. You're perhaps allowed okay, to, but arrogant. You're allowed to have your opinion yeah. on things. You know, you're a professional. You're allowed to have an opinion. And even the psychologist, you know, we could technically mention his name because he testified in court. Okay. The judge ripped him apart and said he should be reported to the council. And he was ultimately reported to the council. Okay. And these are all public facts. But Well, we don't have to mention <laughs> on his the name. One hand, he got his comeuppance from the judge. Yeah, and, and the HPCSA. And we can get yeah. into that later on. So... So, yeah, so how did he overstep his boundaries? If he just said, I've been seeing Mariska for the past four years, these are the issues we've discussed in therapy, and if the, if the court thinks that's relevant at some point, either, like you say, during the trial or at sentencing, they can, where he overstepped the boundaries, where he said, I think the shooting happened that night because of Batwoman syndrome. So he's, he's starting to interpret the facts of the case. Mm. And that's where he's now stepping into the boundaries of the area of being a forensic, even a forensic opinion. And that's what actually is what got him into trouble. Okay. Then let's go to what is bat. Let's unpack battered woman syndrome. Then yeah. what is battered woman syndrome? And um, let's decide for ourselves in this conversation yeah. if it is something that can be elevated to to the level of defense. So it's something we first started to hear about back in the 1970s. And there's one author who's published a lot about it called Walker. Um, but it's not a diagnosis. And that's why it's called a syndrome. A syndrome is like a collection of commonly experienced circumstances, etc. So it's not in your diagnostic manual. That's the first thing. It's not a diagnosis. And, and kind of really what it speaks about is some PTSD-like symptoms, like you intrusive recollections of the previous assaults you've had, hyperarousal, high anxiety, avoidance behavior, uh, symptoms of depression, minimization, etc., denial. Um, but also what happens typically in your battered woman syndrome is the person isolates the his wife or his girlfriend from other people, friends and family, or suddenly you can't hang out with them. They become very sort of one down, submissive. It's almost like you become enslaved mm. to this other individual. Psychologically enslaved doesn't mean you're locked and chained inside your house, but you can become almost like psychologically enslaved. So you start to, it's, it's all my fault, as opposed to actually this guy's doing something wrong. Um, you start to see very negative, think very negatively uh, about yourself as the victim of this abuse. Um, you start to make excuses for this abuse, excuses to yourself, but perhaps also excuses to other people that you may be interacting with, family, that you do have some contact, maybe a work colleague, etc. Um, not all people who are in a domestic violence situation develop better woman syndrome. That's another important thing to understand. It's not an automatic. If you're battered, you're going to have better woman syndrome. Um, and often, you know, you, you, you know you can't escape the situation, so you start to predict when it's going to happen. You start to do things, to, you develop coping strategies. Um, you kind of develop this learned helplessness. I'm stuck. I can't get out. There's nowhere to go. I can't leave. I can't get help. Um, sometimes you start to preempt the violence. So, you know, there's this gradual escalation of violence and you see, oh, things are going the route of this way. Um, and then you try to sort of try avoid it. Sometimes you realize you know, I'm not going to be able to, to avoid this. So sometimes you even trigger it because you want to rather trigger it earlier when it's not as the anger hasn't built up so much. 
or under circumstances where you have more control. You don't, you don't want this to be triggered like maybe at night when the kids are here, so you try and trigger, trigger the anger during the day. Um, you try and anticipate or pre uh, precipitate the event. Uh, you try and control when it occurs. Um, and of course, after the violent event takes place, you get that typical apologizing, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you, forgive me, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of ongoing pattern, which we see in a lot of domestic violence situations, um, but here it's just, what's key here is you get the learned helplessness. I can't leave this situation. So in itself, battered woman syndrome isn't actually a defense. It might be a defense more likely, let's say there's a child involved who's also been abused. And this comes out, maybe the teacher notices the child has injuries and this gets reported to the police. And the police say to you, why didn't you do anything about it, mom? Then to say, because I have this learned helplessness from battered woman syndrome, I was fearful of going to report it. But taking steps to kill your husband is actually contrary to battered woman syndrome mm -hmm. because it's you acting out. It's you taking control. It's you abandoning your learned helplessness and doing something about it. So battered woman syndrome on itself doesn't actually explain why you took violent action. Yeah, so what's the benefit of Titan of naming something battered woman syndrome is, 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 in a, is really in, a, in the treatment space yes yeah. yeah you know that's why that's why because i was gonna say to you why then do we even call something better why do we even come up with the term yeah. battered woman syndrome so that we can kind of give a name to a collection of be behaviors related to a circumstance that you find yourself in that can help in mm. in identifying the best course of treatment so once you've identified like you say, yeah. that just yes? so therapeutically you know as long as you've got this better woman syndrome learned helplessness you're never going to get out of that scenario yeah because your mindset is i'm stuck here how can i make this not as bad yeah um and if you're working with someone in a, in a couple in a relationship issue maybe or she's come to see you for therapy you know as long as she has that learned helplessness she's n nothing's going to change mm. so you'd want to work on that aspect but as um, a legal defense, it, it doesn't really, because the t things they typically want to raise it is f for behaviors when they did something totally contrary to battered woman syndrome. Yeah. So it's not actually in its own self a defense. Like I said, unless like you didn't report or leave the house with your husband because your child was a your husband was abusing your child, and the cops pitch up and you know your mom, why didn't you do anything, mom? We're going to charge you also mm -hmm. for neglect of your child. Then it might have more logic to say, well. You know, if the psychologist says, well, she has better woman syndrome, there's learned helplessness, she couldn't go out and report it to the yeah. cops. She didn't have that psychological assertiveness to go out and do something about it. Now, yeah. still, whether that'll be successful is a second issue. Of course, yeah. But that is more likely to say, why didn't you do something, Mom? Because I'm stuck in this circle of learned helplessness. Just as a small aside, um, or a small comment, um, yes, obviously, women are by far and away the the, the more um more women are victim to domestic abuse um so battered woman syndrome yes but battered per there's battered yeah. man syndrome in fact that was actually raised as a question to the ex their expert the psychologist you know but what about you know same sex relationships mm. you know male or male it, it, it's not always a battered woman so we should be calling it is it woke to say battered person well, syndrome yes but then again at the other side people would say but you know what the women are the most people experiencing this you know, I don't know that's yeah another argument but the issue is it's most commonly noted because of females females being abused by males mm. uh, but yes one could argue should it be battered person syndrome I think what we're trying to say is that this learned helplessness whether you are a man or a woman who's experienced yeah. that um, yes society might look at you differently in terms of you know how helpless are you but yeah the, the, I think that the, these these patterns can develop in any relationship but is it a case of, oh, I'm so hemp helpless, I'm going to go get the sawn off shotgun from under the bed? Exactly. Or, you know, I'm not actually right now under threat. You know, or is it a case of you are trying to argue that she has this learned helplessness, she can't leave, so what she does one day is while he's asleep or gives him the sleeping pool, she beats him with a pan. Mm. Uh, yes, I still think you're going to struggle with that one because you could have given a sleep, you know, is, is killing your only option. So yeah. again, legally on the day in court, it's, it's still going to be it's not a done and dusted deal. Sure. So, but yeah, so that's kind of where we stood and that's what they were trying to argue. And that's when the, 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 the prosecutor, very experienced Cornelia Adamson from the Pretoria D director of public prosecution said, Gerard, 
I need you because if the court accepts this, she going to she could potentially walk out this courtroom not guilty. That's the sort of seriousness of that kind of evidence, mm-hmm. um, and that's where I was obviously called in to sort of get involved and and, and advise. Okay, when you say advice, so would you then provide testimony in court? So the first step is to sort of well. have a consultation with the prosecutor and say, this sounds like nonsense. Because if the opinion is actually there's a good valid argument here, then the prosecutor might say, well, if it's true, and this really is your opinion also, you know, maybe we should accept it. Because you're not out there to just maliciously get someone guilty and stick them in jail. Yeah. They have a duty to say, look, actually, like if someone is potentially mentally ill, hey, let's send him off. And if the if Vescopis or Stackrenten comes back saying, yeah, actually the person wasn't in control of their behavior, it's not the job of the prosecutor to say, how can we negate that report from Vescopis? Yeah, it's the job of the prosecutor to say, that's in the interest of justice, then we are going to say... So, uh, this reinforces the point you were making earlier. The prosecutor is not phoning you to say, Gerard, come in, we need you to bunk, to debunk battered woman syndrome in this case. As an idea. They're saying it, yeah. to you, please come in, advise us, is this line of, of defense going to hold up what is the validity of yeah. it um what is the chances of this becoming a successful yeah. argument from your perspective Provi- and do you agree advi- you do know? you agree advise us on a, a, a route to take mm. and then also come and talk in court yeah. about it when we need you to and it's not even like you say it's not even to say does battered woman syndrome exist or not is it relevant in this case? Mm. Is that what we are seeing here, like temporary insanity? Is it, we're not challenging the concept, but is it what we see in this, does this, does this case have the signs and symptoms and elements of that scenario? So yes. that's the starting point. And, but you will get a lot of experienced prosecutors who will know, ah, uh, this isn't adding up, you know, because they have their own experience from interacting with psychologists and prosecutors. And she, as I said, she's very experienced. So that was my first thing. And, and from the consult, I said to her, well, hang on a minute, the, my first problem here is that you can't have the therapist coming to give you a forensic opinion. They're, they cannot, by definition, be objective. And the HPC, the Health Professions Council, says you can't have multi-dual roles, role conflicts like this. And this is, if you look at the guilty verdicts on the Health Professions Council website, which anybody can go and, and look at, this is one of the most frequent reasons why psychologists are actually convicted of something, is they've mixed this role. So, What happens to you as a psychologist if you are convicted of this? Well, we'll discuss because that's what happened to this. Okay, fine, fine, uh, this, fine. This went that route and we have okay, us having to ten. report this individual. Let me not jump the gun then. So, and I first that's the first problem, that even if what he's saying is factually correct, unfortunately you've got this role conflict. It shouldn't be coming out of his mouth. It should be an independent person formulating that opinion. Um, so that's the first issue. One of the other complications of that is, remember, he was treating this young lady. Now, and he saw her the day before the shooting. If anything, you could argue, did he screw up? You know, oh, okay. you know, should he have seen, is, is he on a conscious or unconscious level trying to make an excuse for her behavior? Okay. That's the other reason why you shouldn't be the therapist doing this because that's one of the questions going to put to you is, wow, wonderful therapy. You were seeing her up until the day before the shooting um, and this is what your client did. Your yeah. patient murdered someone. That's usually not seen as a great therapeutic outcome. <laughs> so should, did you miss something? Should you have done something earlier? So that's also why now you come to the court and trying to give this explanation. Where's your credibility? So yeah. that's practically one of the other reasons. And how can you even attempt to have that credibility when you're not speaking from, yeah. when you haven't had the same direct interaction with, um, with Jacques? Yeah. Um, and that's, that was the, one of the big questions we said because in his evidence, he started to say that Jacques was a rapist. He had raped the accused. Uh, is he a policeman? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and Jacques is a narcissist. So that's, and I said to the prosecutor, how can he say that? Th- there was never in the history of this whole thing uh, ever a rape case opened up against, um, yeah. against Jacques. Um, they so what's he basing that on? Counseling? Yeah, he, you know, he never came for his own sessions or even couple sessions. So how can he even use the word narcissist? That's a classif- That's a psychological classification. Is he not doing that, again, to bolster his statement that this bad woman... Or even if that's what she told him, he has no idea that that's factually correct. And you throw on top of it, you have someone who has a borderline personality disorder who views things a bit skewed about, you know, relationships, etc. So... And that is one of the angles of criticism that eventually when we went and cross-examined him and, and I ultimately testified, where we went down that route of saying, but 
he's really stepped lot, overstepped lots of ethical boundaries, classifying someone that he didn't ever have consent to classify to, to. And even if he did back then, if Jacques had gone to see him consensually for, for co couples counseling, the fact that Jacques is dead doesn't mean that your limits on confidentiality fall away. It's like if you're, if you're a doctor and your patient dies, you can't now suddenly go, oh, did you know that that patient of mine who just died had, had, had a sexually transmitted illness and had this and told me that? I mean, the confidentiality doesn't fall away. So even if he had come across these things in his assessment of Jacques through whatever process, you don't have no right to speak about these things in court unless the court orders you to. Okay. So various ethical transgressions uh, that this guy had sort of stumbled into and he should have known better just on that on those grounds yeah um and when he was cross-examined he had to admit actually yes he didn't have any information to back up the rape allegation and actually no he's only basing this on what she told him but no you're you're continuing to see her for therapy after she's committed the act yeah so how do you know that if she knows you're going to testify that she's now not spinning the world in a very particular way to i mean you surely you should understand that hang on a minute this is i'm in a double bind here and of course, we requested his notes, which were, I don't think there's a politer word than to say his notes were a shit show. Okay. Of when, when we got them, it was, it was scribbles. It was an, you know, a couple lines that didn't make sense throughout. But we couldn't ever find, I think there was like one query, um, domestic violence question mark. Never did he write the words better woman syndrome at all in his notes. Okay. So we weren't getting support from his own notes that we actually say, oh yeah, we can see from ourselves from this notes, these notes, actually there is signs of domestic violence and battered woman syndrome. So is this something you dreamed up after the shooting? Mm. But you know, he's not the one that's deciding the tactic that the legal team is taking. Mm. So it's also, it's not just that, mm. I mean, we can talk about his transgressions and his kind of ignorance from an ethical point of view of, of kind of, and, and his, igno his ignorance towards himself because he's getting himself into a terrible yeah. situation. But it's, here you've got the the legal team that is willing to go down this yeah. road with him also not recognizing that they're stepping into a ethical swamp you, you know what the problem is the lawyers will say to you i'm not a psychologist i'm not an expert i'm guided by what this expert is telling me i don't know how psychologists should or shouldn't be working i don't know that this is an ethical transgression that you were treating her if the psychologist says you can come and testify about these things by all means. So I do think they, they sometimes use that to innocently claim that there's not their fault. I do think a lot of these guys would know this sounds like bullshit, but hey, if my expert's prepared to come and testify in court, who am I to argue otherwise? Yeah. So yeah, I, I think they kind of get away with it by saying, I'm not a psychologist, how would I know? But I think there's also, it's a great way to play naive. Yeah, yeah, the legal Because system. it suits you, because what this psychologist is telling me helps my case and my job as, as the lawyer is to get my client off or at least to represent them as effectively as possible yeah don't you can't you can't blame me for being stupid yeah you know i'm not an engineer <laughs> how can i say an engineer's report is wrong yeah you know what i mean okay yeah, you could also ask another person i don't know but, yeah, but you are the person constructing the argument and so and this argument should, suits you you need to have yeah, it, it suits you, but you need to have faith in the kind of in the mm. logic and the in the logic that underpins your argument, don't you? Yeah. All right, fine. Ne uh, so, yes. So we cross-examine him, and then I, through the, well, the 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 prosecutor, Alfred Horamson, says, Gerald, I'd like you to assess Mariska for state of mind at the time of the incident, because because this kind of was delving on criminal capacity, you know at the time of the incident, etc. So I said, fine. And they consented. And I would then had a couple of sessions with her. I spoke to work colleagues. I spoke to family members of her. I spoke to family members of Jacques, the deceased person. Um, I had a whole bunch of people that I interviewed. I looked at documentation. I had footage of, you know, events that where the couple were at Bry's that I had a look at. I spoke to the neighbor. So I had a very, very extensive amount of information. And of course, I actually even went with her to the house where she was still staying at the time uh, with her son. And I said, right, walk me through what happened from that night. And she, and I had that all recorded on my, on camera. And she took me through the whole evening, how it unfolded, etc. And what I was essentially looking for is at, at, with that particular aspect was, did she consciously and intentionally pull that trigger? 
Was she going to say, I was trying to scare him and I bumped my elbow and the trigger went off, the gun went off by accident, you know, the Oscar Pistorius versions of, <laughs> you know, it didn't happen, I pulled the trigger, I didn't pull the trigger, I didn't mean to pull the trigger, anything of that? Or does she describe, and the next thing I know, he's dead on the floor and I don't know what happened. You know, something illustrating, you know, was there an absence of control of the mind? And clearly, I mean, she describes step for step for step for step up until pulling the trigger after she'd pulled the trigger, et cetera. There's no, there's no absence of the brain, the mind being present, et cetera, psychologically. Um, and I said, even, you know, you didn't bump your arm against the wall. Hmm. And that, she said, no, I pulled the trigger. I wanted to cock the gun, but it was already cocked um, when I was trying to. I pulled the trigger. Why? Because I just couldn't take it anymore. So that ruled off quickly, very clearly any sort of temporary insanity, if we want to use that type of terminology. We're actually going to, we're going to park the temporary insanity. For, we'll talk about it for the, con, for, you know, in the context that we need to in this case. But we're going to have a, quite an another case discussion around yeah. another case with this. Because it does get into very kind of gray, you get into very gray mm. areas if you really start deep diving into that. <laughs> Okay, fine. So you found no, not that. So she had, she'd been aware of what she was doing. Is basically yeah. what you're saying. Now here you have very interesting ballistics evidence, um, which comes into play. I don't know if it's worth, if we should bring it up right here, but sure. um, which also helps. You know, from her point of view, do you, was that did you get a sense that there was some naivety as to how? specifically the ballistics evidence in particular would be able to kind of demonstrate where people were when the trigger was pull yeah. put was pulled where you know what the what the layout of yeah. the room was and where people were placed yeah. when the actual the moment of the murder yeah so that's where you kind of wonder if it hadn't been there which she had tried other types of defenses so Obviously, from the forensic pathology point of view, shot in the back of the head. Yes. All right, so you can't argue that you shot him in the front when you shot him in the back. Yeah. Uh, and it was with a shotgun, so, you know, it, and, you know, we could, we could tell where he was standing because you have these pellets that hit the wall and where the pellets that went into the person's head, there's obviously this, this gap of pellets. We'll put the ballistics, some of the, we'll put some of the crime scene yeah, um, not the gory material stuff, but we'll on. Put, I won't yeah. put the gory <laughs> stuff on, but certainly where you can see the wall yeah. and where you can see the forensic photographs that the yes. ballistics team have done. Because they, it's also, and I actually interviewed the guy that did the ballistics mm -hmm. um, just last week. We did a, we went out to the shooting range with him and did a whole thing on, um, on ballistics. Um, and for in the forensic field um and uh, he was actually midway through standing up as well mm. so the photograph taken is not with him seated it's not with him standing the photograph which will again check it out on social media you can see kind of where the, his head would have been positioned and where the bullets kind of went mm. into him and mm. then created and then hit the wall the around his them, head yeah. um and he was in the process of standing up they you know they took his height and they realized that yeah. he was not fully standing he was not fully seating yeah. when the trigger was pulled he was getting up yeah so you know if we didn't have that and let's say um or the shot had been at a different angle she could very easily have said he was coming at me with a knife and she could have just put a knife there you know she could have very easily raised a self-defense yes straightforward self-defense i was protecting myself we've got the footage you can see he was fighting with me earlier the night but the fact he was shot someone in the back of the head and yes. as you said the position he was in kind of forensically rules out you being able to use those kind of defense so that's where it was important by blocking perhaps certain types of defenses that would be potentially very difficult to prove or otherwise I, look, I said if she shot him in the front of the front of the body or the front of the head it and she just said he was coming at me 
And you, she very likely would have gotten away. Because supported by the the evidence you see, where yeah. you know she is getting pushed over outside the front door and falling over. So yeah, and in the kitchen the she's getting knocked into the ground. Yeah, you know, yeah. pushed and she fell. So there is evidence of violence against yeah. her in the evening. Absolutely. So, again, um, so my ultimate evidence was like as I said at the time when she pulled the trigger, she knew what she was doing, she knew what she was, why she was pulling the trigger, uh, etc. So nothing there that would say not responsible for your behavior. Um, we do know that whereas battered woman syndrome was about that learned helplessness, she was anything from a learned helpless young lady. She would socialize, go out, visit friends, family, her and her son would go out. Um, she would travel overseas on business trips by herself and then extend, ask if she could extend the trip to stay with friends. So that's what you wouldn't get that in the battered woman syndrome where your husband is controlling your behavior. He probably wouldn't even want you to go overseas. And what they would typically do to prevent a partner having to go on a business trip is, is beat them up the day or two before. So now you can't go, oh, you got a call in sick. So, and then she would stay with male friends who allegedly, you know, a gay friend of hers in London. Can I stay with him an extra few days? And he would say, sure. She was the main breadwinner, and she earned a very good salary. So it wasn't as if she had, we were stripped of her financial independence. Like I said, she would go out, you know, visit her parents and stepdad who stayed very close by, go watch movies with her son. There was none of that controlling of her behavior. I mean, she worked, she sometimes, when she was working at Midrand, if she was working late, the employer would put her up in a hotel. You know, a husband who is this controlling behave that leads to better women sort of would say like hell you're sleeping over you come back home yeah you know um so there was a massive independence she was very assertive if you we interviewed people who would socialize with them and they said no if she gets a few drinks oh wow that mouth starts to really flow with swear words and get very kind of aggressive towards him and 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 so she was not this downtrodden battered woman in any sense of the word mm. financially psychologically in terms of her movements, her behavior, her interactions with people, absolutely not. At the very least, she sounds like the kind of woman that gave as good as she got. Absolutely. And you can see that on the video, in that when they're yeah. fighting in the kitchen, yeah. you know, she's pushing and you know, poking the finger in his face, and she's telling him, if you hear in the video, like, get the F out of my house. Yeah. F off. And when, he, when she goes to the front door, she opens it, and she's trying to pull him out. He wasn't stopping her from going out. Mm. So definitely this whole issue she was very assertive in various contexts and we see on the footage itself um so she, yeah so definitely nothing that was really supporting that she was this better woman and had learned helplessness was it issues of domestic violence that popped up yeah i think there was back and forth a bit of domestic violence over you know in in that relationship um she had less lethal opportunity she'd called she'd already called the cops to say please come here my husband's assaulting me she just had to wait a bit more for them to get them to get there no, he wasn't trying to stop her from leaving the house. So she could have left the house. You know, as I said, she worked in Midrand every day. She traveled overseas. Lots of opportunities. She could go to her parents' house mm -hmm. around the corner and say, Mom, I'm leaving. I want to be out of here. Lots of opportunities. So ultimately, what, what did the judge say? So that was my evidence. In fact, after that, they then changed their tune and said, we'd like to abandon that whole defense. And my client would like to admit that she had no excuse for shooting. Because I think they realized, well... We've destroyed their expert um, in cross-examination to the point where he's had to agree that actually nothing that he said is actually still valid in terms of the defense, in terms of the abuse, allegedly, that he, you know, the rape aspects, the narcissism, and that he didn't do a good job. And of course, compounded with my report that was submitted, they basically said, okay, we basically want to, we can't, it's too late to change it to a guilty plea because you're already in the trial, but we want to make the admissions that she had no justification, that better woman syndrome is off the table and, you know, what is left over but to find him guilty mm. and the judgment the judge actually said we can put very little weight on the evidence of mr psychologist not me the other one having regard to the following factors the concessions made to him by him during cross-examination the concessions made by the defense counsel in relation to the evidence of that witness after cross-examination coupled with the fact that mr x the psychologist was not an impressive witness. It's clear he had no knowledge of his role, or what was required of him as an expert witness. It's abundantly clear, as the records would reflect, that he was not objectus, objective. He was clearly biased towards the accused. He was unable to answer many questions put directly to him and engaged in generalized and speculative responses. And in fact, the judge actually said he should be reported to the Health Professions Council, which is what happened. Okay. And? And? A hearing was held into him, his behavior. 
um, the defense or his lawyers represented him at that HPCSA hearing called a, a very well-known psychologist who I believe I was shocked at the evidence she gave. I won't mention names. Um, okay. Yeah, you anyway, I was just shocked. The, the, the HPCSA called their own expert witness, um, Chantal Valdek, who is a psychologist working at Stadfontein, um, and basically said he behaved in an unprofessional way. And, and ultimately they said, yep, role conflicts, um, unprofessional behavior, his notes were shocking. I mean, he even said, we even said to him in cross-examination, but your notes are like scant. You, you can hardly even really follow what you've written mm -hmm. here. No, I rely on my memory. Then we said, how many patients do you see a week? 40. Sure. So 40 in a week, that's just one week. And this is now over a couple of years. You're telling me you're going to remember everything you should have written down. Yeah. And so he was ultimately found guilty. And I think um, yeah, what are the consequences he's not allowed to that? do forensic work. He has to work under supervision, undergo some further training. I think that's where the sort of, okay. he wasn't outright banned from practicing. Yeah, okay. But um, definitely in terms of forensic stuff, he has to go for supervision, et cetera, et cetera, and training. So but uh, a, but uh, the thing is, my, my, I'm sorry, jumping in yeah, here. Yeah, my, no, what no. makes me so angry is that imagine if this had been in a magistrate's court, a lower level court, right? and a prosecutor who's not au fait with dealing with these types of things. And a, and a prosecutor who didn't know, hey, I can phone Gerard, and mm. I can then get Gerard involved, um, et cetera, who might have just accepted the psychologist's evidence. And then the magistrate is kind of open to accepting it because it wasn't challenged, or might themselves believe this nonsense. And that's where I get very upset, because the consequences here is that justice might not have been done if we'd had different role players in the courtroom itself. Mm -hmm. And that's why I get, I have very little sympathy for psychologists who step into the courtroom and do a crappy job because they just, they just, they don't know any better yeah. or they're intentionally trying to manipulate their findings to suit the side that's paying them a lot of money. No sympathy that if I'm there and you're gonna get grilled, I don't care what happens to you yeah. as a psychologist because you deny justice to a victim's family. Yeah. And then of course, the potential to be reported. They're really aiding and abetting in this context, a crafty lawyer who's kind of like, trying a tactic on a on a particular court that he thinks might work in yeah. a particular context absolutely yeah. so if you're going to ever do anything to do with the court systems go for supervision sure go to someone who knows what they're doing you can phone me you can find other people and say i'd like your advice i've gotten this request well, one of my patients lawyers has just phoned me before you do anything phone either your medic your insurance provider they should also be able to give you advice or someone like me or another person who has forensic court work experience because what seems innocent in terms of a response can get you into a hell of a lot of trouble yeah. if you step into a courtroom and you say those things so we have takeouts for if you're if you are somebody that experiences some kind of abuse i think the one takeout that we always seem to come back to when you're in a relationship that where there is any kind of controlling behavior or you know these kind of really negative behaviors just bail man hey gerard because <laughs> you know you can go down a rabbit hole you don't know somebody how what extreme these things can escalate to and this is why i said at the beginning of the discussion that on some level we've i think most of us have experienced this i think you have to be very lucky to go through life not to experience whether it's a couple at a braai one evening that display a certain mm. type of behavior or whether it's your mom and your dad going at it, going yeah. at each other throughout your childhood, um, yeah, this this is a very relevant story to so many people. Um, at least we can take away from it that battered woman, woman syndrome is 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 there a scenario where battered woman syndrome you could envisage that it's a defense in this kind of case? Well, you've gone and killed your partner. I think it would be very difficult. I think it would be more background context. Okay. Because let's say you, like I said, you wait until your partner's asleep and you go get the frying pan. That's not, that's... You really want to go... The courts aren't going to look and go, okay, yeah, sure. That was your only option. Yeah. But you might want to present it at sentencing to say, this poor woman was stuck in this. She, she couldn't get out. She couldn't leave psychologically. Yeah. And this is what was left to her. That's not going to excuse you for going to kill someone because there are still options. You just maybe don't feel you can use them. Yeah but maybe it could be a mitigating factor. And if that evidence is there historically, I'm not gonna argue that that, be, that that would be presented as mitigating factors that the court can take into account when they give you a sentence. Yeah. Um, temporary insanity is maybe, a, the lawyers maybe should have gone down that road a little bit. 
a little bit. Well, in this case, they maybe would have been slightly more sensible to go down that road. Yeah, they they wouldn't. Yeah, it wouldn't have got through after my walkthrough with her at the crime scene because she clearly. But yeah, that that, would that have been a better option to try? Um, We definitely need to unpack this temporary insanity thing, which we We will will do. do, Yeah, another interesting case. Let's do it next week. We will do that next week. any further comments on this case, Jared, before we wrap it up for the week? Um, like I said, I think this is where the scenario where the, you know, as I said earlier, prosecutors that don't have access to people who can give them advice like this. Like I said, I happen to know this prosecutor because I'd worked on cases with her previously. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, I've had cases where I was actually called by the defense and she was a prosecutor. So I've been on b- both sides. And I've got another case now which I might be assisting her with um, in court. Um, and this is where it's really worrying that, that they don't always have access. You know, people who work at the government hospitals, it's not their job to advise prosecutors on these cases. And they probably don't have the forensic knowledge to advise them. And they're not going to be able to sit in court and spend time helping cross-examine and doing assessments if it's not part of their day-to-day job responsibilities. So this is my biggest concern is that there's nobody there to whose job it is to assist prosecutors and, and help them understand, if anything, just understand the evidence that's been presented. It might be completely valid evidence, but to understand it and how to use that in their prosecution. So that's my biggest concern about this. You know, the NPA either needs to appoint on a regional head office level people who can say, well, here's the report, this is what I think, this is how we should approach it, good, bad evidence, etc. And ultimately, you know, you know, unfortunately, the law says we, we, you need to be in control of your anger. Yeah. Anger is not a justification to go commit a crime. Yeah. Um, what was the psychologist then actually just, uh, what was the psychologist actually um, convicted of? So he was charged of unprofessional conduct, um, acting in a manner not in accordance with the norms and standards of the profession, uh, failed to give evidence in court on diagnostic evidence. You were incompetent, uh, testifying without proper clinical notes and psychological assessment, bias in your testimony in, a, in favor of an accused person, uh, negligent um, in keeping of your clinical notes. Um, and ultimately, he was convicted by the Health Professions Council. Um, do, 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 do placed under supervision for 12 months. A supervisor be appointed, which holds monthly meetings and to monitor the person. Uh, at the 12 months, the supervisor must re- submit a, board to the, a report to the Board of Psychology um, that he can revert to unsupervised practice. He pay a fine of 20,000 and comply with the yearly continued professional development. But I mean, not everybody has to do that. It's a really bad outcome. So though. working under supervision for 12 months and mm. a, a fine of 20,000 rand. I mean, how do you come back from that after the 12 months? I think you've got to move to, you've got to find a new... Um, well, I can still do is you see his patients. Base. He just will have to go for supervision, yeah. you know. And I, I mean, he wouldn't be able to discuss every single patient with that supervisor because oh, if you're going yeah. once a month... Oh, I see. I okay. mean, you can't discuss all how many, you've seen how many people in a month. How oh, many so sessions. he's not being supervised in every session with... No, not no. He so can basically, you have to go practice, for, okay. yeah, basically monthly meetings. And uh, I guess the supervisor will have to figure out how she's going to supervise what he's been doing. Um, I would have preferred to have seen that he's not allowed to do forensic work um, until he's, you know, gone for further training and then had, had then, and then have supervised forensic work. Um, you know, to suspend a psychologist, sometimes I feel like they should be, but that you're basically barring someone from earning income. And if you're a psychologist, that's kind of the only way you're going to earn income. So that is a very serious thing. Um, of course, this is public information now. I mean, and of course, if he tries to testify again in court and anybody finds out about the previous judgment at, in, by the high court when they commented on his performance, and of course, then the, these ensuing HPCSA findings, you know, this is going to really just... It just immediately discredits him, doesn't do, it? But I, I'll be very surprised if he sets foot in a courtroom soon. He really just... I think it was, uh, by the end of it, it was a horrible experience for him. And I think hopefully he's learned his lesson that he needs, if he ever wants to even consider this work, he should get some good supervision. But the psychologists think that once they're qualified, they're, you know, they're God's gift. That's the problem sometimes. So, sentence. What sentence did Mariska get? Well, on the 3rd of September 2019, she was sentenced to 10 years for the murder, um, four years for the unlicensed shotgun that she had used, 
uh, one year for the single round of ammunition that she was in possession with when she fired that shotgun, and defeating the administration of justice, kind of like obstruction of justice, three years imprisonment. So essentially, these kind of are going to run concurrently. So she, at the max, would serve 10 years. Of course, she could potentially come out on parole about halfway through if she behaves herself. Um, so you might think, what about 10 years? That's, is that very little? It is on the lesser side. I think what counted in her favor in sentencing is the fact that there had been this domestic violence on the night in question. And I think in my report, I even said that if that fight hadn't taken place, I don't think she would have killed him that night. So I do think that was instrumental in pushing the emotions up. And we can see it's a back and forth fight between the two of them. So I think the court did take that into account. Um, that this wasn't a premeditated murder. She didn't pre-plan this. Think about how she's going to put the plan in action. You know, fake it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She tried to make it look like it wasn't her on that night in question. Once she had actually done it, but she was also convicted of that aspect. So yeah. So uh, on the on the lesser side for for spontaneous intimate partner murders, I typically would see ten to fifteen is kind of like the norm in terms of that spectrum. So, but on the lesser side, and I think that uh, the, the domestic violence that occurred that night did weigh in her favor. The bottom line is that this was a relationship that was in a bad way, it was in a bad state. Yeah. Collectively, I mean, you know, maybe one or the other bears more responsibility for the dynamic in the relationship, but it was a bad relationship. And, and if you find yourself in these kinds of situations, get out of them because, you know, yes, it may be men that commit more murder than women, but you know, in that situation, either of you can kind of come short at the end of the day. Mm. And um, if these things can escalate so out of control. Um, think about those yeah. times where things have, where you could have gone left, but you luckily went right. Yeah. And in this, this is case, one of those scenarios where it went left. This, you have a child who was still in sort of primary school age who's lost mom and dad. Absolutely. You know, so and that, is that no doubt trauma, you know, is in the, is in the, is in the house and no doubt traumatized yeah. by the experience. So it's, it's a lose lose all, all around. Um, okay, so what are you what are you left with from this case? Um, I think again for me, this case could have turned out very differently if we had a different prosecutor who wasn't as knowledgeable and skilled. Yeah. So Advocate Cornelia Harrison, fantastic prosecutor, very experienced, knew that she needed to get someone involved to give her advice on this, knew who to phone, for example, me in this particular instance. You know, a lesser prosecutor, less experience, maybe in the magistrate's court, might have just accepted this evidence without, well, just had the attitude, well, this is an expert, what can I do to challenge an expert's evidence? Mm. And, and accepted it and allowed it to go through, which means we could have potentially had a very different outcome. Mm. Worst case scenario, Mariska walking out of that courtroom, a not guilty verdict. So that's a big takeaway. And, and that's what scares me is that how many of these cases do go through where there isn't someone to advise the prosecutor. Absolutely. We can turn, we can say, I can say on this podcast that, wow, it's clear that the defense team was being a bit silly here or not being as smart as they could have been, but maybe it's quite the opposite. Maybe they understand that with the right, given the right set of circumstances, these kinds of defenses can fly and can get your defendant off, basically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which is, you know, just added to our list of worries when it comes to law enforcement and justice in South Africa, guys. Thank you so much, Gerard. We'll be back with another episode next week. New episodes of the podcast every Monday. Um, do go out and get yourself, um, you know, if you want to delve more into the subject matter, get your hands on the Profiler Diaries, book one or book two, always available on shelves. Also, a great read to look out for is a book written by our very good friend, Nicole Engelbrecht from uh, True Crime South Africa. She's released an awesome book uh, entitled The Samurai Sword Murder on a wonderful case that we have discussed previously on the podcast. So um, do go out and get that as well. Um, and yeah, you know, we're always encouraging people to get their fill of South African true crime. Um, and we hopefully are one place where you can enjoy a weekly conversation about it. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube page. Follow us on our social media platforms. And we'll be back in a week. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you. Rest easy, everyone.